You can go ahead and pull this out. Once you've got color change, you can pull that out. My name is Benny Joyner, and I am the director of the Clinical Skills and Patient Simulation Center for the School of Medicine, and I also am the director of the simulation program for the Department of Pediatrics and the Pediatrics Residency Program. Simulation has been a very big interest of mine because I'm a former educator, and so I used to teach high school uh, many, many years ago. Trying to do this, I mean, as opposed to if you, now just let go of it for a second and just. So that has translated into my interest in uh, terms of educating medical students and residents. Uh, if you look at educational theory and adult educational theory, for me, simulation sort of highlights uh, all of those aspects. It engages the learners and it as allows them to actively participate in their education. They can take the traditional didactics that they've learned and apply it in a simulated setting. Rather than looking at a PowerPoint slide or just talking, looking through a book, it's a way to actually practice um, and I can have a fellow or an attending demonstrating this is exactly how you place the tube, this is how you do ch chest compressions. It just ha has a ton of advantages. That with this, if you get the tube in, it's what we call a definitive. We were the first institution along with Harvard, Stanford and University of Florida to have high fidelity simulation in the 1990s. And so as this technology has grown, we're increasingly deploying our fleet and growing our capabilities. Currently, we have uh, one adult uh, mannequin, three pediatric uh, infants, and three pediatric toddlers within the entire School of Medicine in the hospital okay, setting. You have your seal right now because you're getting good chest rise. How come we didn't give medication when we intubated? Well, that's a great question. So uh, that Bruce, as problem. a mannequin, um, will simulate a lot of the physiologic variables that children have. He appears to be a 40-pound toddler that's about five years old, and he can breathe, he can um, uh, have heart sounds, his belly can distend, and you can perform procedures on him as well. Morning, Bruce. I'm just going to check you out here, do some vital signs. Bruce? Bruce? Hey, can I have some help in here? <laughs> How do you think that went, guys? One other aspect of simulation is the opportunity for high fidelity simulation specifically to really enhance teamwork and patient safety. We've been able to uncover real sort of fundamental systems issues that we can look at to try to improve patient care. Do you recognize that rhythm, Shelby? So just as simple as where's the location of that particular drug that you need? Is it readily available? Or where is that device that you need to shock the heart? Is it readily available? When you're in the PICU, when we do a mock code and we say, okay, let's shock this patient, they have to actually find the device, know how to turn it on, how to charge it, and then how to deliver the shock. And that's a very complex interaction that I think that you know, we've been able to uncover and figure out that we know what to do, but how to do it or how to engage you know, the team to make it happen is really the key thing. And I think that's really leading to improved patient safety and improved patient outcomes. Can you go ahead and give some atropine? And I think that once you recognize that you got effective compressions and you call for the medications that you needed and then you call for the code uh, fairly quickly, so I thought that was great work.